Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown, and uh, right there is Matthew Stockton. I'm at the kitty's table. You're at the kitty table. Yeah, because I ordered a new table that just hasn't gotten here yet. And we're in a new studio. We are at Mike's new place. Yeah. Um, I had such a good time driving here. One of my favorite things to do is uh, it's sunny today. Yep. Drive in the sun, roll down the windows and blare Primal Screams album Screamadelica. Screamadelica. I'll have to listen to that later. It's fantastic. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor its parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. On April 12, 1991, a group of teens attended a woodland party near Oromocto, New Brunswick, involving alcohol and drugs, including LSD. Pamela Gail Bischoff, 14, and William Wayne Dale Billy Stillman, 17, left the gathering together, marking the last sighting of Pamela Bischoff alive. Stillman returned home later, wet from the thighs down, cold, shaking, and sporting a cut above his eye, with mud and grass on his pants. Six days later, Pamela's body was discovered in the Oromocto River a short distance from the party site. The time of death correlated to the point in the evening that she had left with Billy Stillman. Eyewitnesses confirmed seeing a male accompanying Pamela near the discovery site, and Stillman was seen later departing the area, his pants muddied. An autopsy showed that Pamela's death resulted from head wounds and there was evidence of sexual assault, which included semen inside her body. Billy Stillman was arrested, released, arrested again, and eventually charged and convicted in Pamela's murder. Stillman's appeals were based on alleged inappropriate conduct by the RCMP officers who collected important DNA evidence from him. This resulted in the case being heard and decided in Canada's highest court in 1997, and a new trial was ordered. This is Dark Poutine episode 269, The Murder of Pamela Gail Bischoff. Oromocto, where this story takes place, is located in the province of New Brunswick and has a history that dates back thousands of years. The town's name is derived from the Maliseet word Wellamokotuk, meaning good river or deep river. The Maliseet are the indigenous people who resided there for centuries before European colonization. The region saw its first European settlers in the 17th century, but the town of Oromocto didn't formally exist until the 18th century. The British established a military presence in the area as part of their strategic control of the colonies, and a significant military influence remains today. One of the key moments in Oromocto's history was the construction of the nearby Gagetown military camp during World War II. 
This camp would later become the 5th Canadian Division Support Base Gagetown, one of the largest military facilities in Canada and a significant influence on the town's economy and growth. Oromocto was heavily affected by the 1950s Mactaquac Dam project. The dam's construction resulted in widespread flooding in the region, relocating several communities. Oromocto was among the towns rebuilt in new locations, and the modern town of Oromocto was officially incorporated in 1956. Imagine having your town completely relocated. Right? It's like, uh, yeah, we're building a dam, so you're moving. I'd assume that was a painful process. Sure. Right? Yeah, for lots of people, because, you know, this is our home. We belong here. On top of that, they used uh, some concrete that was off. Mm Mm-hmm. And in the early 2000s, they realized they needed to fix the dam. <laughs> it cost them $3.6 billion. Oh, my goodness. I just geeked out on it when I was reading the script. Yeah. And uh, I guess there's a bit of a summertime traffic nightmare because um, the dam is also like a major bridge. Yep. And it's like been, you know, shut down to one lane for a number of years. Now. Oh, no. And the New Brunswickers still suffer through it, I think is what I'm trying to say. This summer and next summer as well. Today, Oromocto is known for its close ties to the military base and the diversity it brings, along with its rich natural beauty, including its proximity to the Oromocto River, from where it gets its name. The town proudly upholds its historical and cultural heritage, represented by various museums, heritage sites, and cultural events. Pamela Gail Bischoff was born in Oromocto to her mom, Gail Mary Lumina, born Kirkwood, and dad, Robert Frederick Bischoff, on October 3, 1976. Robert served in the military as a pharmacist for 28 years and later worked in the same role at Shoppers Drug Mart in the Fredericton Mall for more than a decade. On the blog nbgwen.ca, one of Pamela Bischoff's longtime friends gave some insight into Pam's character. Gwen wrote, quote, Pam was intense, vivacious, confident. When she walked into a room, you knew it because she was the life of the party. She got me to hitchhike, something I had never done before. She made me step out of my comfort zone in so many ways. She was magnetic. Even though I was the oldest, I was 17 when she died, I never felt like it. She was mature beyond her years. She was rebellious. She loved her parents deeply. As much as she fought with her older sister, she loved her deeply too. Gwen continued. I still remember spending the night and her knocking on her bedroom wall, calling to her mom, it was morning, Mom, can you bring me some orange juice? Of course, her mom did. Pam knew her mom would. Her parents would have done anything for her. Everything Pam did was done with intensity and passion. We were crazy kids. We did things we shouldn't. We were carefree. We loved life. There was four of us in our group of best friends, Pam, me, Gina, and Rhonda. We were joined at the hips, and that was that. We made nicknames for each other. Pam was Pam Pam. I was Gwembles. And it's awful, but I can't remember what Gina and Rhonda's were, though I'm sure they'll remind me. End quote. What would your mom do if you knocked on the wall and asked for orange juice? She would have told me to come get it myself. (laughs) My mom is great. She's hilarious, but she would not have done that. Mm -hmm. When I was listening to that, it reminded me of um, when when we were young, if my mother, if my brother and I were, were like, Mom, what's for dinner? She'd yell, shit on a stick. Oh, dear. And the implication was, in other words, you'll get what you're served and you'll be grateful that it's not shit on a stick when you have it. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I, if I, I, I remember my mom knocking on my wall because my wall shared with the kitchen table kind of thing. And if I was in there listening to ACDC. She'd be like, turn it down. Exactly. My call. <laughs> anyway. Pamela Bischoff was last seen on April 12, 1991. She'd gone to a party in Deer Park around the old train bridge. The area was a popular party spot for local teens at the time, in all likelihood it still is. Now called Deer Park Nature and Trans-Canada Trail System, according to ormocto.ca, it is utilized for recreation like walking, jogging, hiking, non-motorized biking slash wheeling, horseback riding, cross-country skiing, and snowshoeing. The 102 Provincial Highway Bridge runs across the Oromocto River at the park's southwest edge. The old Trans-Canada Rail Line runs along the southernmost edge of the park, and the old train bridge runs across the Oromocto River to the southwest. 
The Trans-Canada Highway Bridge also crosses the Oromocto River just over 300 meters south of the old train bridge. Pamela was there that evening as a member of a group of 17s, which included Billy Stillman. Her friend Gwen later wrote that it was a group that Pamela didn't typically run with. The group went to a makeshift camp in the woods and then to the train bridge, indulging in beer and wine and partaking in LSD. Like any other small town, teen partying around Oromocto often involved booze and cigarettes and rarely drugs. Remembering her own party times with Pam, her friend Gwen wrote, quote, Yesterday she and I rolled old tobacco into a somewhat smokable cigarette. I quit a long time ago now, Pam. Yesterday we drank a magnum of hermits. I'll never do that again. I don't even drink anymore, Pam. End quote. Between 8 p.m. and 8.30 p.m., William Stillman and Pamela Bischoff decided to separate from the rest of the group and went off together. Pamela did not come home that night, and her family was extremely worried when she didn't show up the next day. From Pam's friends, they learned that, in all likelihood, the last person to have been seen with Pam the evening prior was a 17-year-old boy named Billy Stillman. Billy and Pam had apparently split from the main group around 8.30 that evening, and no one saw Pamela again that night. Jennifer Bischoff, Pam's older sister, called Billy Stillman's home and spoke with him. When Jennifer asked Billy whether he'd seen Pam since last night, Billy replied in an odd way. He reportedly said, why? Is she missing? That's kind of dodgy. It, kind of? Yeah. <laughs> like, you say no. Yeah, no, I haven't seen her. What's up, right? Yeah, exactly. Why is she missing? Why is she missing? Hmm. After exhausting their resources looking for Pamela on their own, on the afternoon of Saturday, April 13th, 1991, Gail Bischoff reported to the Oromocto RCMP that her daughter was missing. The missing person case was assigned to RCMP Sergeant Jill Blinn, who gathered Pamela's particulars from her mother. The family hadn't seen Pam since she'd left to go out with friends the night before. Pamela wore a black jacket, a white blouse with black stripes, black jeans, and white sneakers. Her underwear was a set, pink bra and panties with black polka dots. So we both talked about our mothers a little bit already. I think that's because... We're recording actually on Mother's Day. Yeah, we're thinking about moms today. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I think that makes it a little bit more poignant uh, of me thinking what Gail must have been going through yeah. um, at this time. Yeah, for sure. I mean, your kid doesn't come home. It's normal to worry. Yeah. Absolutely. And if it's an abnormal thing for your kid not to come home, you worry even more. Yeah, you know, people always say a mother shouldn't have to go through this, but they shouldn't, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they shouldn't. During the conversation with Sergeant Blinn, Gail Bischoff didn't mince words about what she believed had happened to her 14-year-old daughter. For the documentary series Dark Water's a Crime, Blinn talked about how shocked he was when Gail Bischoff told him in no uncertain terms, looking him straight in the eyes, that she knew Pamela was dead, that Billy Stillman had raped her, murdered her, and dumped Pamela's body into the Oromocto River. Blinn attempted to console Gail, but... She was adamant that she knew what had happened, and it was bad, very bad. Although Blinn's staff sergeant said it might be wise to wait for the weekend to expire and perhaps Pamela would then turn up, the staff sergeant didn't want to waste resources on someone who might be willfully missing. Oromocto's population in 1991 was 9,325, and like so many small towns in Atlantic provinces, Oromocto is generally a safe place. And violent crime is extremely rare. It's not every day that a 14-year-old girl who comes from a stable home goes missing in that part of the world. In rare cases, teens don't come home for one reason or another, but Pamela Bischoff didn't fit that profile. Blinn decided to start a police search for Pamela that day, and they began to try to trace her movements and determine her whereabouts that way. You know, until I started on Dark Poutine, I thought this uh, whole... 48 hours before you report somebody missing thing was true. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe a lot of people share that right. idea because it, it persists in sort of older depictions in the media, like old TV shows and the news and um, movies, right? Right. But, you know, when you stop and think about it, it's really important to understand that if you're concerned about somebody or you think they might be missing, time's of the essence, isn't it? Absolutely. Like, absolutely of the essence. And in fact, unfortunately, even if foul play has already happened, mm -hmm. you're getting police on that trail a lot faster to, be, before, the, um, before the evidence goes away somehow. Yeah. 
Pamela's friend Gwen recalled a telephone conversation with Pam Bischoff just hours before she vanished. Gwen wrote on her blog, quote, She had called me before going out that night to tell me about her new stockings her mom had bought her. Her mom had to travel over an hour away just to get them. They were special to go with her grade 9 prom dress. Back then, junior high was grades 7 to 9. Her dress was black from the mid-hip up and with a gorgeous purple skirting. She was so excited. I can still remember the sound of her voice when I think of that phone call. She hung up, saying she would talk to me later. She hung out with a group she normally didn't. She never called me again, end quote. Also in her writings, Gwen indicated some frustration with the RCMP. Gwen wrote, quote, We knew she wasn't a runaway, even though they tried to tell us she was. We knew she would never leave without telling us. We knew it was going to be bad, end quote. Everyone who'd been at the party and had last seen Pamela that evening said she'd been in the company of Billy Stillman, so investigators were anxious to talk with Billy. Once Sergeant Blinn spoke with Billy briefly the next day, he found the youth calm, cool, and collected. Over the next few minutes that Blinn and Billy spoke, the officer observed that the young man was relaxed and unemotional as he answered the questions about his movements and when he'd last seen Pam. He said he and Pam had hung out for a while and then went their separate ways. Now, regarding the cut above his eye, Billy said that while walking home, he'd been jumped by a group of five indigenous men who beat him up. That old chestnut. Yeah. That always bothers me so much, this, this diverted attention to our First Nations friends. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, throw them off the trail. And, uh, you know, it's, it's always generalized, right? And probably in, in the United States, I, I, actually, I know we've seen stories in the States where people, you know, blame a group, a group of black guys or yeah. indigenous. And it's like, mm -hmm. try to throw them off the tra trail and throw an entire race under the bus, right? Yep. It's horrible. It tells you the nature of this guy. Yeah, definitely. The search for Pam Bischoff escalated later that day. Her photo was distributed to the media, hoping to elicit public assistance in her location. Anyone with information was encouraged to make contact. However, this strategy led to a flood of calls reporting supposed sightings from all corners, necessitating a thorough investigation of each. Regardless, the search efforts continued relentlessly. RCMP canine units were employed and an RCMP helicopter was utilized to survey the Deer Park area. Over the same weekend, an RCMP boat was dispatched to search the river around the train bridge for any possible evidence, but unfortunately none was found. On learning of Pamela's disappearance on the news, a civilian dog handler from Halifax, Leonardo Caldi, called to offer to bring his dog to Oromocto for another sniff around. Blinn waffled briefly, but, but eventually relented. What could it hurt to have another dog nosing around? Caldy came out with his dog on Tuesday and went to work. Blinn received another phone call that afternoon. His staff sergeant asked him to head over to the Bischoff family's home. The dog had found something. When Blinn arrived, Caldy showed the officer a small brown paper bag. Inside the bag was a pair of dirty pink panties with black polka dots just like the ones Gail had earlier described as the ones Pam had been wearing on the evening she vanished. Gail was beside herself. According to Blinn, she said over and over, I told you, I told you. She's dead, she's dead. Caldy removing what might be evidence was a problematic thing to do. Blinn remarked that the proper procedure for finding something suspicious is to leave it where it lies. Don't touch it and contact police immediately. They'll then come out and collect the item securely, following the proper procedures for gathering important forensic evidence. Blinn hoped that there'd be more evidence in the area and asked Caldy to lead him to where he'd found the underwear. And it was near the Trans-Canada Highway Bridge, not the train bridge. The RCMP dogs hadn't searched there. At that point, there hadn't been anything that would lead them to do so. The train and highway bridges were over 300 meters apart, and all the sightings of Pamela up to then had centered around the train bridge. They performed a more thorough search of that area, and sure enough, there in the mud, near the river, was a single white sneaker, matching the description of the pair that Pam had been wearing. There was no sign of Pam. Looking at the river, investigators knew that this was the next place they had to search. That meant admitting to themselves that Pamela Bischoff may not be coming home alive. More after a quick break. Anne 
And we are back. Matthew, thoughts so far? This is going to sound weird, but uh, probably are, are, are not. You, are you posting that picture of her on, on the website? Uh, I might actually post it in the show notes. Yeah. Okay. So whenever I look at photos of victims mm -hmm. and I, it didn't quite click as to why, yeah. I always paid attention to the hair and the clothes. Sure. Right. And what I realized is this image of them is them locked in an era. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Like she had the bigger hair that late eighties, early nineties, all girls had in Canada. Right. Sure. Like very specific style for, for the era. Yeah. And you just see her and she's locked in this at this time and she never had the opportunity to do what we do. Right. Post pictures on Facebook laughing. At, Look at my hair back then. Yeah. You know, she never had these opportunities. She's a beautiful woman. Yeah. Never had opportunities for, you know, the boyfriend or getting the, the or girlfriend or getting the first apartment or maybe having kids or any of that stuff yeah. completely gone away. And that that's when I see these old pictures and when they're locked in an era, it, it kind of hits home to me that uh, all, everything else is, was missed because yeah. because of this. Yep. Right. Yeah. Life. Yeah. A life was ended. even even the hardships of life or li is living and learning from them. Right. Mm -hmm. All of that's taken away. Yeah. Tips continued to come in. At around 10.15 p.m. on the night of Pam's disappearance, a driver and his companion had spotted Pamela on the Trans-Canada Bridge accompanied by a male. Another driver was sure they had spotted Billy Stillman walking on a public road leading away from the same bridge sometime after 11.45 p.m. That driver noted that Stillman's pants were muddied from above his knees to his feet. Investigators also learned that Billy arrived at the home where he was staying just before midnight. This matched the timeline given by the other driver who'd spotted Billy walking away from the bridge and toward that residence. Several witnesses at this home reportedly observed him either upon his arrival or shortly after and noticed his distressed appearance. He was spotted with dirt on his face and clothing, wearing jeans and a green jacket. He was cold and shivering. His lower body was damp, and he had a scrape similar to a rug burn above one eye. His trousers bore traces of mud and grass. Upon entering, he returned to his bedroom and sat on the floor beside his bed. Given the number of people present, some assisted him in removing his jacket as his arms appeared sore. Observations included a blood spot and dirt on his jacket, a scratch above his left eye, disheveled hair, and a bruise over his nose bridge. Some described his demeanor as resembling someone who had been in a physical altercation, appearing confused and dazed, giving off the impression that something was significantly amiss. Billy put all his clothes into the washing machine, an atypical thing for him. He also took a bath, a long one. According to Gilles Blin, Billy had spent two hours in the tub. This struck Blin as suspicious, and he decided to speak with Billy again, which he did that Monday. Once again, Billy was cool as a cucumber. Blinn decided he'd try to shake Billy using the blunt words of Gail Bischoff. In the documentary series, Dark Water's a Crime, Blinn said, quote, Monday morning at 8 o'clock, I went and I was going to take an on paper, what we call a statement from him. I can still recall this as though it happened yesterday. I'm in uniform. I looked him straight in the eye and I said to him, Billy, I know what you did. I said, you took Pam down by the river, you raped her, you killed her, and you threw her in the river, didn't you? And I'm a police officer in uniform, and he was a 17-year-old kid. And that kid never batted an eye. He never took a gulp, he never turned red, he never fainted. No sign of anything that I would deem suspicious at the time. End quote. Blinn decided to take Billy to the police station for a more formal statement. Billy stuck to his story, again saying five indigenous men had beat him up, but it all seemed like a tall tale to the seasoned cop. Blinn needed more, but Billy was a stone wall. Talking to Billy's friends, investigators learned that the day after Pam disappeared when questioned about the marks on his face, Stillman informed a teammate from his volleyball team that he'd been assaulted by six to eight individuals he identified as indigenous. A few days later, he changed his account again, blaming a man named McCarthy for the beating. But McCarthy later denied this allegation under oath. After the discovery of the shoe and panties, the decision was made to bring RCMP divers to search the cold water of the Oromocta River around the Trans-Canada Bridge. The river ran fast as the winter snow melted upstream, so they weren't sure what they would find. The next day, the divers were there, searching the river. 
The diver swept back and forth, tethered to another officer on shore who would feed out rope as the search of the waterway was covered from bank to bank. As the diver searched, another investigation was taking place. This inquiry looked into a string of vehicular break and enters which Billy Stillman, his brother CJ, and another friend were believed to have committed. Constable Pat Cole questioned the three suspects about the B&Es. Toward the close of Billy's interview, Cole took another opportunity to ask Billy about Pamela Bischoff. Again, Stillman denied any knowledge of her whereabouts. The interview ended, and Billy returned home. Cole was doing another related interview when he was informed that an urgent phone call had to be taken. It was C.J. Stillman. He was reporting that he'd discovered that Billy had wandered into the woods with a large knife soon after his arrival home from the B&E interview. Billy had left a suicide note behind, bequeathing his belongings to family and friends. Billy had signed off on the note saying he'd see his loved ones on the other side. The pressure appeared to have gotten to Billy Stillman. Cole went to the residence and spoke to CJ and the friend, whom he convinced to look for Billy in the nearby woods before he did something he couldn't take back. The officer felt it better for the two to go alone as the presence of an RCMP member might spook the youth. Sure enough, CJ and the friend found Billy sitting alone in the woods in tears. They convinced him to return to their residence where Billy talked with Pat Cole who was waiting. Billy said people at school and in town were harassing him about Pamela, and he said people had threatened to beat him up, and he was afraid. So she hasn't even been found yet. Yeah. And he's making people go look for him instead of her. Right. Right? Yeah. Selfishness. No. Oh. Finally, Billy changed his story. He said that Pamela had attempted to die by suicide, trying to drown herself in front of him. He claimed that he'd tried to stop her and then he left her alone. He said he didn't know what happened to her. He said he didn't know what happened to her after that. The next morning, six days after she disappeared, one of the RCMP divers, Constable Dan Desero, was the one to discover Pamela Bischoff's body. She was dressed in dark clothing. What caught Desero's attention was Pam's left cheek, which was incredibly pale against the dark water. Pamela Bischoff was discovered approximately 8 to 10 feet deep, curled into a fetal position with her face directed toward the rocks as if she was hovering over them. The divers proceeded cautiously to extract her without causing any damage and maintain as much evidence as possible. Investigators noted the state of Pamela's clothing when they pulled her out of the river. Her pants were undone and pulled down. Her shirt and bra were pulled up. As her panties were found on shore, someone had redressed her after a probable sexual assault. She had marks on her consistent with a beating. Her eye was almost swollen shut and inconsistent with a simple drowning. There appeared to be an angry and obvious human bite mark on her abdomen. The pattern of bruising on her body made it clear to the officers that Pam had put up a tremendous fight before her death. They leaned now strongly toward homicide during or after the commission of a violent sexual assault. The autopsy confirmed their fears. Pamela had not drowned. As detailed in court documents, Pamela had suffered a severe head injury, resulting in brain swelling and cerebral edema. This was what had killed her. Semen was found in her vagina from a recent sexual encounter, and it was confirmed that it was, in fact, a human bite mark observed on her abdomen. The flesh with the bite mark was preserved and sent to Montreal to determine whether it had happened before or after Pamela had died. The results of those tests indicated that the bite had occurred either after Pamela had died or she had been very near death when it was administered. Pam's father, Robert, and sister Jennifer visited the morgue to identify the body. It was indeed Pamela's. Billy Stillman was arrested on April 19, 1991, a day after the recovery of Pamela's body. Stillman was taken to the RCMP headquarters in Fredericton. Upon arrival, he consulted with his lawyers for more than two hours. After this meeting, a letter, signed by both lawyers, was handed to the RCMP officers. The letter stated that they were representing Stillman and advised him not to consent to provide any bodily samples, including hair or teeth imprints, not to give any statements or communicate with the RCMP without one of his lawyers present. Despite this explicit refusal from Stillman and his lawyers, the RCMP were determined to get the samples they were after. 
Even though DNA evidence was still in its infancy, the cops knew that it was a valuable tool to rule someone in or out of a crime. There was no process in Canada for obtaining a warrant to obtain DNA before this case, and in fact, it was this case was instrumental in changing our laws. Against Billy's will and forcibly, an officer collected scalp hair samples from Billy Stillman using a gloved hand to comb through and clip the youth's hair. Additionally, the officers demanded that Stillman provide samples of his pubic hair, which he did under duress. They also swabbed his cheeks and forced him to give a dental impression. Without the presence of Stillman's parents, lawyers, or anyone else, the RCMP proceeded to interview Billy Stillman for an hour. During this time, the constable attempted to persuade Stillman to make a statement. Throughout the hour, Billy sobbed but remained silent. And after an hour, he reasserted his right to have counsel present. A lot of problems there. Yeah, big time. <laughs> a lot of problems In a there. big way, yeah. And we'll talk about DNA in a minute, but um, mm -hmm. it, you know me, Mike, right? So somebody's done something I don't want them to get off, right? Right, right. But you have to follow proper procedures and, and you have, people have civil rights. They do. Yeah. Right. And even a criminal, even, even a, an alleged oh, criminal. And that's the thing. Alleged. Yeah. Right? Innocent till proven guilty. You, you know, and it, it makes it harder. But the, the flip side of that is the jackboot on your neck. Right. Right. Yep. Um, frankly, and it's true. Um, you know, so I was kind of, I was trying to also figure out, so we'll talk about the DNA, but maybe one of these cool lawyers who listens to us can call in as well. But I was trying to look up. So I got onto a website called Educaloy, which is an interesting name, but they, yep. they try to simplify and make legal information more accessible, right? For Canadians. Yeah. And yeah. it said teens have the right, we know this, teens have the right to contact a lawyer and one of their parents before talking to the police, right? Mm -hmm. And parents can be present when the police question them, but the teen has to ask for that. Right. And I don't know where teen, where it's like, hey, it's a little kid. It changes. I don't know the... the, the, the I think it's like 11 years the old. The age, right? Yeah. And uh, I found this interesting as well. So if none of the parents are available, a teen can choose another adult right? So it doesn't have to be your parents. And in right. fact, if one of your parents doesn't have custody, that parent still has parental authority and can be asked for. So this idea of if somebody is divorced and they don't have custody, that doesn't matter. Right. Right. So um, that's important. Right. right? <laughs> I mean, so he was questioned for an hour until he asked for another lawyer, yeah. which, you know, it's not cool, even though they had already spoken to him and he'd already refused to like, all this aside, like they took DNA stuff from him that was at the time not a legal thing to do because they had no warrant, because there's no way of getting a warrant, yada, 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 on and on. Interestingly, I've watched a couple of true crime programs from the UK and they have a program there called An Appropriate Adult. Mm -hmm. And they even have people who are, train as an appropriate adult to come in and be with somebody who either has lower mental capacity or is too young or is too young. Yeah. And they, they will sit in the room to advocate for that person. Okay. So train sort of makes sort of kind of like a civil, civil liberty sort of appropriate adult. Yes, exactly. Nice. Yeah. So maybe uh, that's what I'll do in my retirement. M maybe we need that here in Canada. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It, it might be a good thing. It doesn't make it easy, easier for the police to do their jobs, but protect the kid. People's rights should be protected, regardless of what they ha are assumed to yeah. have done. And I mean, with stories like this, when you find out the truth and everything, you, it's easy to go, well, screw them, right? Yeah. Um, but you got to do this because it can actually jeopardize justice. Yes. Right? And in this and, case, and, it almost did. And I want justice for Pam. I want, I want justice for Pamela, right? Yeah, me too. After this interview and DNA collection... Constable Patrick Cole escorted Stillman to a washroom. Among other actions, Stillman used a tissue to blow his nose. This tissue was seized by the constable and was found to contain mucus. Billy was kept in custody on the related B&E charges and sentenced to a group home after pleading guilty to those offenses. Police searched Billy's home and found nothing they could use. Billy had washed every bit of his clothing. 
At Pamela's well-attended funeral, the song Something to Believe in by her favorite band Poison was played. In those days, it took a long time for DNA to be analyzed. Several months later, the results came back. The results indicated that the biological evidence, particularly the semen sample, matched the ones from Billy Stillman that the RCMP had collected and sent in. The likelihood of him not being the contributor was 1 in 16 billion. Following this revelation, his lawyer escorted him from the group home to the authorities. Subsequently, Stillman was arrested in connection with Pamela Bischoff's murder. Billy, although 17 at the time of Pam's murder, was tried as an adult in 1993. He pleaded not guilty. Throughout Stillman's trial, the prosecution emphasized the DNA and dental evidence. The judge conceded that collecting hair and teeth impressions infringed on Stillman's charter rights. However, the evidence was deemed admissible because it was factual and existed irrespective of vi- because it was factual and existed irrespective of, vi- of the violation of Stillman's rights. The judge further held that the police were within their rights to gather additional samples during a lawful arrest. In the case of the tissue that had been th- in the case of the tissue that had been thrown away, the judge decided it did not amount to a search, as Stillman had forfeited his privacy expectation by discarding it there in the bathroom. Billy Stillman was found guilty of Pamela Bischoff's murder and sentenced to life without parole for 25 years. Billy appealed the verdict based on the claim that on collecting the DNA, hair, and dental impression samples, the RCMP officers had trodden on his rights, specifically Section 8 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which states, quote, everyone has the right to be secure against unreasonable search or seizure, end quote. The Provincial Appeals Court upheld Billy's conviction, so Billy's attorneys appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada for the final word. In 1997, the decision came. The DNA evidence collected against Billy's will was to be thrown out. It was inadmissible. However, the tissue Patrick Cole collected in the washroom after Billy blew his nose was another story. That would be admissible. Lots of stuff going on here. From the Supreme Court's decision on the case, quote, In contrast to the hair samples, teeth impressions, and buckle swabs, the police did not force or even request a mucus sample from the appellant. Billy Stillman. He blew his nose of his own accord. The police acted surreptitiously in disregard for the appellant's explicit refusal to provide them with bodily samples. However, the violation of the appellant's charter rights with respect to the tissue was not serious. The seizure did not interfere with the appellant's bodily integrity nor cause him any loss of dignity. In any event, the police could and would have obtained the discarded tissue. They would have had reasonable and probable grounds to believe that the tissue would provide evidence in their investigation and therefore would have sealed the garbage container and obtained a search warrant in order to recover its contents. Quite simply, it was discoverable. In my view, the administration of justice would not be brought into disrepute if the evidence obtained from the mucus sample were to be admitted. So, Interesting. That was a big decision. A huge decision. That was sort of pivotal here in Canada. And it was also pivotal for this case. Yeah. Because had they thrown all of it out. Then it would have been a lot harder. Billy Stillman could have walked free, even though it was very clear that he was the person who committed the crime. Yeah. Crazy. So if you ever have a drink. Yeah. When you're being interviewed by police, take the cup with you. Yeah. I just watched uh, an episode of the... uh, American detective with Joe Kenda, which I love on Discovery Plus. And the person who was the suspect, a cop offers him a water bottle. He drinks from the water bottle and then puts it in his pocket. (laughs) And then the guy says, I need to have a cigarette. Can we go outside and have a cigarette? And so the cop thinks, okay, I'll just grab the cigarette butt. The guy smokes, stubs out the cigarette, picks up the cigarette butt and puts it in his pocket. (laughs) So it was very clear that that guy, A, had something to hide and B, had been coached on yeah. how to... Or C, just knows the civil liberties, right? <laughs> right. Well, this guy was actually guilty, so... Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, interesting stuff. A new trial was ordered and set for January 1998. Gail, Robert, and Jennifer Bischoff would have to endure hearing and seeing the horrendous evidence of Pamela's murder all over again. 
As a result of these circumstances, a warrant was issued to acquire further samples. However, Stillman, now represented by a new lawyer, was uncooperative, and his attorney wouldn't allow any conversation with him. Whenever an attempt was made to collect samples, Stillman simply shut his mouth, refusing to comply. Consequently, the authorities escalated the matter to a higher court, requesting permission to use any existing evidence against him. Given Stillman's lack of cooperation, the judge granted the prosecution the right to use the DNA samples and dental impressions collected and analyzed in 1991. The evidence that had been thrown out was thrown right back into play. In mid-January of 1998, Billy Stillman surprised everyone and changed his plea to guilty of the second-degree murder of Pamela Bischoff. He has never talked about what happened that night by the river. The evidence paints a grim picture. Even though he was tried as an adult, as Billy was a juvenile, the maximum sentence he could receive was eight years behind bars, which the judge gave him. According to Pamela Bischoff's pal Gwen, in a comment on her blog, Billy Stillman is out of jail, is married, and has a family. Pamela didn't get that. She'll be forever that 14-year-old girl who died on April 12, 1998. Pamela's dad, Robert, died at the Oromocta Public Hospital on Monday, November 11, 2002. So I guess they're together somewhere if you believe in that kind of stuff. But, uh, but yeah, again, like, back to what you were talking about sort of at halftime, uh, yeah, she didn't get to have a life. She no. didn't get to have the, you know, she would have been around our age. She would have been. She actually reminds me of a friend of mine. And I'm looking at the picture of her and I was just, there's, there's, there's that spark. You can see she, she liked to have fun, right? Yeah, she was a bit of a devil, I oh, think. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. I love girls like that. Yeah. Um, that, those are the girls I hung out with in school, right? Sure. Like the ones that, that had to like pu push the envelope a little bit, had a little bit of fun. I liked them too, but they scared me as well. <laughs> I was, <laughs> I was, I was a bit of a wimp when it came to that stuff, but. It's, um, no, and it's just, you know, yeah, you know, I just need to look at that picture of her and you, you, she's like a kid and you want her to have a life. Yeah. And fuck, I, I, sorry, I swore. I hate doing shows sometimes because i just want the people to be alive <laughs> well know? i mean yeah is this is you're involved in a true crime podcast matt i know but you know it makes me sad yeah sure it does right? because you're a human being makes me sad especially you know sometimes you feel like you can just relate to people more a hundred percent yeah yeah That's right, it's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1 877 327 5786 or 1 877 D A R K P T N. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. All righty, let's listen to our first voicemail. Here we go. Hi, guys, I'm Kristen from Halifax. I've been listening to you guys for a while. You're my favorite podcast to listen to. Um, I just wanted to add on to your latest um, your, your latest episode, the Mark Twitchell one. Towards the end, you guys were ta talking about names for bras. And I've heard the over-the-shoulder boulder holder one before, but I just I wanted to let you know that a friend of mine growing up used to call them stop-ems, these flop -ems. I don't know where she got that from, but I've never forgotten it. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say because I think it's hilarious. Go take a shit in your hat. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah, so <laughs> stopping the flopping. Stopping the flopping. <laughs> it sounds like Danish or Swedish. Was is los? He's stopping the flopping. It's German, Matthew. <laughs> Fuck it. What you got to buy for your wife this Christmas? I buy her a stop in the floppin'. Stop in the floppin'. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, my. Here's another voicemail. Hey, guys. I, uh, short-time listener, first-time caller. Really love the podcast. I, my name's Felix. I'm from the Yukon. And I'm a harm reduction worker. 
spoiler alert, you don't get to guess. Um, <laughs> I really enjoyed your story about the prohibition of marijuana and its racist roots and really spoke to me because as a harm reductionist, uh, it's kind of what I preach in my job. I'm an educator, so I talk to service providers and discuss how bias and stigma literally kills people, uh, especially when it comes to people who use drugs who are houseless. So, um, yeah, that story really resonated with me, and I wanted to say thank you for telling it, and great show. I hope you both go take a shit in your hat. <laughs> <laughs> I love that look. Yo, boy. Yeah, boy. Thanks, Felix. Yeah, thank you so much, but we don't get to guess. But maybe uh, Felix has a hobby, Matthew. She's a chief hockey stick tape artist. Oh, there you go. So she specializes in making sure it's done the right way. Okay. But I, I, want, I want Felix to say hi to my friend, uh, Robert Postma. Okay. In the Yukon. All right. He's they a, probably know each other. Famous photographer. And, oh, is he? Yeah. Yeah. A ve very good photographer. And I bet you $100 Felix knows who he is. Oh, she probably does. Yeah. We forgot to give our first caller a job, though, from Halifax. I don't know what that person does. I think uh, she's a maple syrup sommelier. Really? I didn't know they had those in Halifax. Yeah, an expert in the art of maple syrup tasting. Well, there you go. Right? Pairing, so, pairing different grades and flavors, right? Mm -hmm. Someone's got to do it. Does Halifax, does Halifax not have a maple syrup, like um, sugar shacks or anything like that nearby? No. Okay. Not that I'm aware of. They may they may now, but they didn't when I was growing okay. up. Okay, well, but that's why they need a sommelier. Oh, someone who can direct them right? to, to because, the best yeah, tasting. She, she learned it in Ontario and Quebec. And, sure. Uh, yeah. That makes sense. That would be a good job, actually. It probably would. It'd be, <laughs> I'd be very fat. Yeah, that would be like, I've, I've been known to drink maple syrup out of the bottle. There's nothing wrong with that, Matthew. I'm not going to shame you for that. Uh, let's listen to our last voicemail. This one's about two minutes long. Hi, this is Eli again. Um, I just called a second ago. I wanted to try again. I'm super anxious to be doing this, and I thought I heard my roommate walk into the room behind me and was waiting to talk to me, so I just kind of panicked and hurried up and finished. Um, but what I really wanted to say was um, a few other things, the first and foremost being that I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts. Dark Routine is absolutely my favorite, without a doubt. And, uh, you know, I know people say it all the time, but it's it's really important that you guys really focus on the impact to not just, you know, what happened to the victim and, and focusing on their story, which is huge and great, but also that you focus on the impact to the community, even just, you know, the people who may have discovered a, something traumatizing, um, you know, related to the crimes. And I think thinking about them and taking them into account as people is really incredible. And that's really what brings me back every week. Um, and I think that by redoing some of the earlier cases, you get a chance to really bring that into focus. Like you said, Mike, um, doing that dark poutine treatment to, uh, to those first cases again, I think is really great and really special. And again, also getting the chance to, get Matthew's perspective this time around is really great and bring something um, else fresh to the case. So I'm really looking forward to hearing some more of the old um, episodes remastered in the new style. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so I think it's going to be great. All right. Thanks, guys. Go take a shit in your hats. <laughs> well, thanks for calling, Eli. Like, Eli said he was nervous, but he didn't come off very nervous. He came off very confident and uh, and sincere. So great. I loved it. Eli is a poutine engineer. She's Oh, Eli is a poutine engineer. So uh, perfect combination. Perfect. Of fries, curds and gravy. Yeah. The, the And the for the ultimate poutine experience. The cheese has to be a certain has a, has to have a certain type of squeak to it. <laughs> Exactly. That's make your teeth squeaky. Well, thanks, Eli. And we are planning, we are planning on some more redos. 
Matthew's making <laughs> He's giggling uh, over here, making squeaky, squeaky sounds. sounds. It sounds like squeaky bed springs. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we're planning on a lot more of those. There's some that I I kind of am like, okay, I'm I'm relatively happy with the way that turned out. Uh, but yeah, like the Twitchell one in particularly in particular was I think super important to do because, like I said, I felt like I got a lot wrong with that one. So anyway, that's been corrected now. You've grown so much over the last years. Five years, yeah. almost six. Yeah. It's crazy that it, it's been going on this long. And you've been with me for two of those. Over two now. Yeah. I'm loving this new place. Oh, yeah. This is <laughs> so Mike's Mike's moved to um a town called Abbotsford. No, it's Langley. Sorry, Langley. <laughs> I don't know where I am. Matthew doesn't know where it's he is. It's lovely, but I felt like I needed my passport when I got here. But I'm driving through it. So Mike's moved from... The and don't say it wasn't because it is mm. like the highest crime city in the country, I think, currently. Right well, now, well, there's a lot of if bad, not, maybe it's number two. Okay, there's a lot of bad stuff happening there, yeah. Uh, to this lovely green area, it's so gorgeous here, yeah. Uh, I, just, I just drove in for the first time. So, was it where, where are we? Abbotsford, we're in Langley, Langley. we're in Langley, Langley. the city of Langley. Is Abbotsford further? Abbotsford is further. Yes. Okay, good. So we're in Langley. Yes. <laughs> um, so I just put, Mike just gave me his address and I just drove. So I don't even know where I am. But anyway, it's really nice. It and, is nice. Uh, and it's. Um, There's a lot of Yumber Yarders and lots of listeners here. So we'll probably have a meetup here in Langley at some point. Because why not? <laughs> yeah. Well, you guys might. I might end up in Abbotsford for him. <laughs> Matthew. Where's Matthew? No, he's in Abbotsford. <laughs> Why? Because he thinks that's where I live. <laughs> yeah, he's not a well man. Anyway, still working on the studio, so you might hear some e <coughs> echo for a couple of weeks and things like that. But uh, bashing away, trying to get it get it done, get it fixed up, and all that kind of thing. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one eight seven seven three two seven five seven eight six or. 1877-D-A-R-K-P-T-N. We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. All right, it is time for some Patreon and Donut Money donor shoutouts. And first up, from Menifee, California. I hope I'm pronouncing that name right. And if I'm not, oh well. <laughs> we have Mary Vuong. And uh, what does Mary do there in Menifee, Matthew? I think, if if I'm not mistaken, I think there's there's like a hot hot air balloon festival or something there. Really? And she is the um, air tra air balloon hot air balloon traffic controller. Wow. Yeah. That's kind of cool. That would be a cool job. It is a cool job. Lots of pressure, though. If she has a lot more time than being an airplane traffic controller, though, she can say, she can like see it coming for about half an hour. And even if they do collide, mm. I mean, they're balloons. Well, yeah. Well, maybe one could start the other one on fire. I'm sure it could happen. Yeah, before. that could happen. That but would yeah, be so that's what she does. Well, thank you, Mary. Thanks, Mary, for keeping our skies safe. We have another Californian. Okay. Her name is Sherry Jackson, and Sherry is from Yorba Linda, California. Yorba Linda. And the, my, both of these places I've never been. My Belinda? Your, not your Belinda, Yorba Linda. Okay. I'm sure it's a Spanish name. My Belinda is Belinda Carlisle, okay? Your Belinda is <laughs> Belinda Carlisle. Are, are you uh, a Go-Go's Belinda Carlisle, or are you solo Belinda Carlisle? I liked both. Yeah, I'm 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 really partial to go-go. Sometimes you just want poppy fun stuff, right? Yeah, which like is it, great. It's not generally my genre, but yeah. sometimes I just want happy poppy stuff. Totally. Right? And she was a good, she she wrote some good ballads. She sung some good ballads yeah. too. So what does Sherry do in your Belinda? Um <laughs> Oh no, he's laughing already. She, well, she's she's the um the president of the Belinda Carlo. Fan associates. Of course she is. Fan club. Well, there you go. Because there's, in her mind, there's only one Belinda, and that's your Belinda. She thinks your Belinda is all our Belindas, and that's Belinda Carlisle. There you go. That's important. Thank you for being a Patreon. Thank you very much, Sherry. Uh, next, we have Linda Marfizi, and Linda is from Campbellville. 
Ontario. Campbellville, Ontario. Campbellville. Do you know where Campbellville is, Matthew? Mm, I've heard of it many times, but I couldn't place it on a map in my head. Okay. I'd say maybe near the elephant's shoulder. Okay. Whatever that means. Well, because if you turn the map sideways, Ontario is the shape of an elephant. Oh, okay. With his trunk up. Right. And the one sound is the butthole. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I thought Toronto was the butthole. No, one sound is the place where the butthole would be. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but you know why I would say that about Toronto. Even though I like Toronto. And uh, I just want to uh, take them down because they're big and popular. It's true. The tall poppy thing. Yeah. Yeah, it is true. I think you should work on that, Mike. Shouldn't I? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did we say what Linda does? No, we didn't. Okay. What does she do, Matthew? Well, being a good Canadian. Okay. She is an apology officer. Oh, we yeah. need those. We need more of those. I'm sure there's probably one stationed on every block yeah. at some point in Canada. Yeah. She makes sure that, you know, we're not pitching out unnecessary apologies. Oh. Right. So sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah. She's like, calm the hell down. Yeah. Stop with the sorries. Stop with the sorries, mm -hmm. right? Like, is, are there fines if you say sorry too much? Yeah, it's, it's a it's a toonie. Oh, it's a toonie. Yeah. yeah. If you say sorry, if somebody steps on your foot and you say sorry, yeah, it's a toonie. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Well, we kind of need that. We do. We say sorry far too much. And not sorry for things we should say sorry about. It's true. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Linda. Thanks, Linda. Uh, next, we have a Vancouverite. Well, at least a Vancouverite now. I don't want to assume that she was born here. And her name is Farron. Farron from Vancouver. Farron from Vancouver. Yeah. Um, what do you think Farron does here in uh, our lovely city, Vancouver? I really want Farron to be one of the Aquabus drivers. Oh, yeah, because you and Steve take those Aquabuses a lot, don't you? Like at least a couple times a week. Yeah. Yeah. Because Steve loves well, them. Well, I told you what one of the drivers said the other day. Yeah. I think you're one of our favorite, if not our favorite customer. Oh. Which was sweet. So, Farron, if you want to be an Aquabus driver, I'll vouch for you. I have an in. Matthew's got an in. Everybody <laughs> everybody who rides the Aquabus knows Matthew. Actually, I want to come and ride the Aquabus with you. We should just, like, do it, take an afternoon and just ride the Aquabus. We should do a show from an Aquabus. Bus. We can. That'd be hilarious. Do you want to do one of our after shows from the Aquabus at some point? Yeah. And, and interview an Aquabus driver. Yeah. And if there's if there's other guests on the boat, we'll just talk to them. Yeah. Okay. That'll be fun. Yeah. Let's do okay, that. We got 100%. Let's do that. And that's it for Thanks, Patreon. <laughs> Thank you, Farron. Now I'm looking forward to riding the Aquabus and, and interviewing people. That, that would be a blast. Yep. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors past and present for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash dark poutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. All righty, and that's it from the first episode from Langley, not Abbotsford, <laughs> Dark Poutine's new headquarters. Are you sure we're in Langley? Uh, we are 100% in Langley. Okay, I'm going to look at the signs when I leave. D do it. Okay. Because you'll see, oh, I'm in Langley. All I know is that I had to go over a bridge to get here. <laughs> yeah, you also had to go across Langley Bypass, which is, uh, yeah, but anyway, there was, there was a lot of indications that you're in Langley. <laughs> Anyway, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple, folks. Bye from Abbotsford. It's Langley. <laughs>